So welcome to our next CRX 2023 talk. I am David Yowd. I have with me Mark Lemmert. He is the Lemmert, sorry. Um, he is the creator of the Apple II RPG Knox Archaist game that came out in 2020, right? Late 2020. And it's uh, December 12th, 2020. 2020. Yep. And it's uh, also you have a 2023 expansion pack, Lord of Storm. So, Mark, thank you for being here this morning. Um, this is pre recorded, so we get to record anytime we want to. So, it was great to finally meet you in person at VCF Midwest. We uh, chatted online for a while. Well, first of all, David, uh, th thanks thanks for having me on. Uh, oh, yeah, happy sorry. To talk to you and uh, you know all of uh, all of your viewers here today. Uh, this is going to be, I think, an exciting conversation. And it was great to meet you at uh, VCF uh, Midwest as well in person. Like you said, we have been chatting for years, so always great to put uh, a live face, you know, to to a name. And uh, yeah, to your to your question. Um, I, I thought it was a really fun experience. Uh, I'm definitely glad that I went at, at your encouragement and uh, wasn't too far of a trek for me being a Midwesterner. It, it's it's fun to see um, across the divide, you know, uh, we have our favorite systems and but just be able to see what other people are, are working on. And of course, where there's lots of displays, getting to talk with people is the best part. And talking with you, um, you know, talking with other people has resulted in many of the CRX uh, interviews that we have for this time so that was great we create our own luck by showing up so okay yes so i played your game when it came out in late uh 2020 there's the box right there um for anyone who hasn't played nox archaist uh this is a gigantic uh rpg game you know it has the feelies you have the you know the the, the map and uh, stuff like that, although there's things not shown on the map that are important. Uh, of course. <laughs> of course. Um, it took me about 120 hours to to finish this, and I had a, a, a Christmas break, and I was like, i got to finish, i got to finish, because my Christmas break is getting used up. So I was using um, a, Rick, a guy named Rickles made uh, with Map Cartographer, a third-party extension that does auto-mapping. I was using that. I was going in and editing memory. I was giving myself more gold. I was going on the forums and talking to the people that had previously played it, so I was I was doing everything I could to get that done. And it still took 120 hours. That is a, a lot of game in there. So thank you for that. That was fun. That pressed all the buttons of my previous 8-bit, you know, kind of RPG experiences, at least as I remember them. I haven't gone back and revisited too many from the past. They might feel different now, but this definitely was very reminiscent of, of all those kinds of experiences. Um, and then you asked if I would want to beta test uh, the Lord of Storms uh, earlier this year. And that was a lot of fun because that's very, um, I don't know what the word for it would be, like uh, exploration dense kind of way, you know, like where every square on the graph paper matters, like in a Bard's Tale kind of game. And there was yeah. hardly any bugs in that. You must have had beta testers before I beta tested because I just felt like, I mean, you, you I, I see your look there, but we didn't really find too many bugs um, as far as, as I remember it. You probably found most of them before I played is all I was saying. But um, sure. Yeah, there were two. Days, there were. Uh, uh, th this is a strategy that I first deployed for for the original Lux game that I repeated for Lord of Storms. Uh, in both cases, I deployed two beta tester groups, and uh, Group One was uh, basically uh, being the first. Uh, and uh, then after Group One had played through it, found bugs, fixed bugs, I fixed bugs, etc. Uh, and and I thought that, uh, you know, basically we'd kind of gotten as far with it as we could, because eventually, you know, people remember the game and, yeah. you know, it's not fresh eyes and all that. Then that's when I deploy group two to come in with fresh eyes and see, OK, what else pops up or maybe some of the fixes on the group one bugs, uh, you know, didn't implement as well as, you know, seen with fresh eyes as, you know, may like, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And, and in the case of uh, the original game and lord of storms in both cases group two went in definitely some things were found a lot of polishing um you know lots of little stuff um but in both cases yeah it, it was it was one where it's like okay there weren't too many like huge big glaring bugs left because those are the in the way those are the easy ones to find so <laughs> yeah there were no there were no uh, questions like you experienced there without necessarily realizing um how it all fit together in the development cycle Oh, yeah. I have no doubt that there was a lot of work done before I actually looked at it. I mean, we had a floor tile pressure plate that turned into a monster and stuff and we were able to track that down. There were some big fun bugs, but 
yeah, between GitHub yeah. and Discord, that was a great way of communicating and getting all that worked out. So, um, okay, let's transition into the deep dive technical talk that I uh, talked to you about potentially doing. Talk, talk. A little, little bit of motivation for that. Um, oh, by the way, for anybody playing Nox Arceus now, it's a lot easier if you have a book of hints that actually should read complete walkthrough that tells you everything. Uh, so that's... <laughs> But only as much as you want. It's yeah, all yeah. each quest is laid out so that it's like it gives you hint one, hint two, hint three, hint four, and you know, put a sheet of paper on there so you can only see the first one and see yeah. is that enough, you know, or or if you want the walkthrough experience, yeah, then just read everything and it's gonna tell you what you need. So you wrote this last year, I think, the making of Nox Archaist. Um and great yes. book. I love seeing how sausage is made. <laughs> Um, lots of pictures, lots of illustrations. Uh, I got to this part in the back, and it is the tech talk. And I was like, ooh, finally, some technical goodness. And you gave me six pages. Six. <laughs> <laughs> that was a huge tease. So I was really hoping that you could go a little bit deeper today. You you hinted that you might be doing another book that is more technical in here. It was Beneath Nox Archaist or something like that. Can you talk about that? Yes. Okay. Yes. That, so uh, first, first of all, um, I just wanted to say, well, thanks for reading the book. I, I absolutely appreciate Thank that. You. you know, that was, that was, you know, the, it was largely, a, a, as you saw, it was less of a, like, uh, how to write a 8-bit RPG manual as it was a telling the story of how did this project come together, this five-year endeavor that it took to develop and deliver uh, you know, Nox Archaeist, a game that was uh, on the on a scale that most people agree exceeded Ultima Five, the last Ultima on the uh, the Apple II platform, and had appearances from developers like uh, Richard Garriott and uh, John Romero and Steve Wozniak. Uh, each each uh, and, and many others had little cameos in the game, and so so the uh, the making a book is like telling like, okay, so how the heck did all this happen in 2020? <laughs> um, that was the focus. And yes, there's six pages of tech talk at the end. And there was also, um, I, 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 I hope you'll agree if you think back on it, there was some kind of like smattering of technical stuff throughout the main body as well. But you're right. I mean, ultimately, it was not designed to be uh, a technical manual. And I did tease somewhere in there, like you said, that uh, perhaps someday there will be another book uh, called Beneath Knox or Chaos, um, which, which is basically a, uh, the name is an homage to the the Apple II technical manual called Beneath DOS, uh, which which really goes down to the hardware and you know talks about the lowest level. I was thinking it was. Stuff. I thought it was uh, the Beneath Apple Manor that you were making a reference to. More people have heard of that than have heard of the technical manual, so I get that a lot. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, yeah, it, you know it's it, it's kind it's kind of it's it's I'll just chalk it up as an obscure thing. It's kind of like how in Lord of Storms. Everyone assumes that the the, the rod of uh, of, of death uh, is an homage to Ultima Three because there's a rod of love, soul, moon, and death. And actually, the rod of death is an homage to Death Lord, uh, mm -hmm. which had a uh, a weapon called the Rod of Death. <laughs> and I was like, I so want to do that. And and then had had to put a context around it. I'm like, well, let's do this whole love soon. I can have some fun with that too. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I I digress. I have a tendency to do that. But um, uh, Death Lord is yeah, on my bucket so, list, by the way, to play. I've heard it's the most cruel RPG ever created. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah, give it a yeah, shot. No, it, it, has, it has it has that reputation for sure. Um, so so CRX and, CRX is a a mostly Commodore focused gathering, but what you're doing is you're solving your development problems with 6502 assembly language. That is the language of all the 8-bit uh, Commodore machines. That is so where I'm, we come together. So yeah, so I'm looking forward to getting some tech details from you that we're missing in the book. Um, if the Commodore folks here learn a little bit about Apple architecture or Apple IO in the process, that just adds to the fun, in my opinion. I, I think this is by far going to be the deepest dive that I've ever taken with anyone mm -hmm. on, on, on any of this with Nox or Chaos. So this is, I'm excited. This is going to be fun. Um, and, and to that, uh, I, I guess with that uh, said, uh, I wanted to explain why am I wearing my Lord British undefeated Nox or Chaos shirt? Of course, not exactly as though it was a, a shirt that needs an explanation. 
Um, but but it fits into the context here quite perfectly because when when I launched the Knox or Chaos project uh, in late 2015, uh, first public mention was early 2016. Um, by by the time of the first public mention of it, at least, uh, I had crafted a mission statement for the project, and it went off the top of my head. It still it still exists on the noxorchaos.com website website today. But off the top of my head, it goes something like this. We're going to try to explore what might have happened if uh, RPG development had uh, continued uh, at a you know commercial large scale past the end of the 1980s. Like, let's just pretend that the PC and Mac revolution didn't happen uh, and, and development had just continued. What would have happened? Because uh, it was ultimately there were commercial pressures uh, market pressures in this change of technology that were huge factors in why companies uh, at one point in, in the case of, uh, you know, origin systems decided, you know what, uh, Ultima 5 is the last one that we're doing on the Apple II and the rest are going to be on the IBM PC. The Commodore, uh, of course, got did get a uh, Ultima uh, 6 version that yeah, but really, from, from what Commodore folks have told me, really shouldn't have been there in the way that it was. True. Um, and uh, uh, so, 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 so there were commercial factors that were driving that decision, and and so what I wanted to see is like, okay, if you pull the commercial factors out of it, how much of the machine was left? You know, how much more could have been done? Because we had seen this decade uh, over the 1980s where um, you know the 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 eight bit systems initially were not technically were highly underused in their capacity because this was a new industry. Developers were just figuring out how to do things. And yeah, over the 10 years, there were a couple of uh, advancements that happened, you know, on the on, on the Apple line, it went from the two plus to the, you know, the two E uh, for the eight bits. Two GS doesn't count. That was that was 16 bit as far as, you know, what I wanted to explore. Uh, so there were there were a couple of shifts up. Uh, but nothing that was like really huge it was still a one megahertz 6502 throughout the apple 28 bit line uh it went from you know uh 48k to, to, to 128k on the ram side over that period um but really i mean we, we we basically saw much more so than the hardware was advancing we saw game development itself was advancing in the techniques and the skill of the developers both from a design point of view and from a uh, programming point of view, uh, you know, look at Wizardry 1 or Ultima 1 at the start versus Ultima 5 at the end. You know, I mean, that says it right there. And that 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 had, you know, uh, a whole lot more to do with uh, the, the, the change in the design, the development techniques than it did with uh, any kind of changes on the hardware, which were minimal. So um, I wanted to explore that and see what would happen uh, and, and what was left. And uh with that being the mission uh the logical thing to do was say okay uh so the 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 pinnacle achievement the height of the art for you know 8 bit rpgs on the apple II was ultima 5 and well any 8 bit platform if you don't you know count the ultima 6 commodore version sure. that really probably would not be considered as the pinnacle of anything if what I heard is accurate as far as yeah. uh how it turned out um so uh so so I set the baseline at okay Ultima 5 that was that was the top yeah uh so to explore what happens next that means that uh for the most part fundamentally the game I was making needed to at least meet Ultima 5's baseline in uh in everything it was doing and then reach out forward than that now that's not to say that i set out to make a ultima uh, five clone i didn't and and the end result uh while it is a heavily ultima inspired game i mean it's it's it's, it's not like i made a you know fan game set in britannia you know and and literally cloned all of the exact systems with the virtues and the, no that that's not what happened in Nox or chaos uh the similarity is in it's a tile-based game 
it's a, a game that has a party of characters uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it has turn-based combat and there's NPCs that you talk to and it has a bigoture map uh, uh, that you walk around in an overworld and you enter into towns and castles that bring up, you know, those are the kinds of, you, you know, similarities. Uh, and uh, so as I looked at Ultima 5, it's like, okay, well, my game needs to have those things. Um and uh and then and and then and then look out at like okay well what's beyond that um and uh so in any event that was where the project started with it and and as a result it became a enormous exercise in standing on Richard Garriott's shoulders sure. <laughs> you know uh to say okay you know what is it that uh you know I would expect that you know he and his team could have done if they made one more iteration, yeah. uh, but didn't because they moved on to something else. And is there, as I, and as I thought about things, it's like, okay, so they didn't do, they didn't do this particular thing that I want to do. Is there, uh, is there a technical reason? Is there, is there a roadblock that prevented it? Or is it just that, well, you know, between each Ultima, there was a set of progressions and at some point, you know, they had to say, this is the scope and move on. And, after Ultima 5 was done, there wasn't another. So they just sort of never got around to it. Or maybe, you know, it wasn't the low hanging fruit as compared to other things. These are the kinds of things that went through my mind for all these years sure. as I explored, yeah. you know, how the envelope could have been pushed. So like I said, uh, it was a big exercise in standing on Richard Garriott's shoulders, a big exercise in, you know, sort of getting into, uh, you know, his head at that time on, um, and, uh, and, and, and so, uh, yeah, that, it, that, that's a fun focus. Uh, the Ultima one, I think came out in 81 and then Ultima five was 88. So there was this rapid fire. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that is a breakneck speed, but they start to have more time between the releases and the development team starts to go way up. And yeah, it had, it had definitely hit the complexity point in a bit space where I don't think they could have afforded the time to uh, have pushed it uh, on the commercial uh, release cycles. They just had to move to the next boxes anyway. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So going back and revisiting what could have been done, um, you know, algorithmically or whatever within the constraints of the memory and with floppy disks having to serve up everything because you guys stuck with floppies, which is admirable and impressive. So anyway, um, yeah, that, that's, it's a good mission statement. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's it's uh, and, and we're, we're, we're going to we're going to, uh, you know, get into the details here. What I want to say in the big picture is um, I, I don't think Ultima six as it was done uh, on, on the IBM platform. I don't think anything that gave that, you know, justice could have been done on the Apple two. There wasn't a version of Ultima six that um, was, uh, as, as many people know, was started. Uh, on the Apple II um, and, and abandoned at one point, you know, they pulled the plug on it and then moved over to the IBM PC. I don't know how far that got. Um, I do know that theoretically the uh, source code still exists somewhere. I actually talked to Richard Gary about it and, and asked him and, and he said something to the effect that, yeah, he thinks that it, it probably does because he's got these boxes and boxes and boxes of floppy disks you know, like in his basement that came, you know, from, from the origin days. And he said, said something like, yeah, well, back then, you know, I was the version control, you know, every time, you know, there was an iteration, you know, they burn off a cop of floppies, hand them to me and I throw them in these boxes. So it's probably in there, you know, he said, I'm like, please, please, you know, preserve this before the floppies die. But that's a, you yeah. know, a whole other thing. Uh, so I don't, I don't know. Uh, and that's going, you know, uh, you know, too, too, too far back. I wasn't going to try to torture him to remember the details, but, um, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know how far that got, but just, you know, based on the, the, the experience that I've gone through here now, I think I'm in a pretty good advantage point to know what's possible, you know, on the machine. And, and I, I, I don't think that anything close to Ultima six, you know, could have sure. been viable. So what we ended up with with Knox or Chaos was, I, I believe, a successful mission in pushing the boundaries. And what we ended up with from like, a, as measured by like a gameplay technology standpoint, uh, I clock it in, it's somewhere in between Ultima 5 and Ultima 6. Um, hard to say it's like, is, is it, you know, 
kind of in the middle? Is it more towards Ultima Five? Is it? I would say it's definitely not more towards Ultima Six. It's it's probably in the middle, or maybe still closer to the Ultima Five end of the spectrum as far as the gameplay tech goes. Um, but that's you know uh, obviously that's that's kind of a almost a subjective measure uh, in, in any in any event. So what we're going to get into it, it you know we we keep burying the lead here, but uh, you know is we're going to talk about some of these specific things that you know, push the envelope that, that, uh, that, that, that took it out a bit farther. And so, um, uh, anyway, uh, where, sh where, where should we start on that, Dave? You want, want so, to just dive in on one of these yeah, tech your, topics? Or... So your, your book talked about a couple of topics. Um, one of them was your pathfinding for your characters. Um, I mean, clearly the, the characters in Ultima five have schedules and Ultima six, they have it. Um, you said in your book, you went with an A star search algorithm. You also indicated that that didn't become prevalent until the early 90s. Um, so what were the challenges in getting that implemented in your game? Sure, yeah, well, that's a great one. So for, first of all, NPC schedules. Um, that was something that Ultima 5 had. And so, you know, in, in the uh, spirit of the mission statement, I thought, okay, not Nox Archaeus needs to have NPC schedules because that was a huge innovation between Ultima 4 and Ultima 5. And it's something that Ultima 6 had. So, excuse me, to, to achieve the mission, mission, it's like, okay, we need NPC schedules to get to baseline. And then let's see if we can push it a little bit farther in some way. You know, that that was the mindset going into that that particular project. And now as far as challenges go, well, first of all, was that uh, uh, to, to my knowledge, and I'm pretty confident of this, Knox A-Star is the first 6502 A-Star algorithm ever written in a uh, commercial game. And uh, as a result, had to deal with uh, memory and disk, you know, limitations that uh, were not nearly as much of an issue in the early 90s when it started to become, uh, you know, commonplace uh, in in the uh, the more powerful platforms. Yeah, it'd be um, interesting to see how the SSI. I never liked the the hex based war games, but they had to have something to to pathfind on those too. It'd be interesting to see how they did that. Um, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah, there's there, there's a variety of ways ways to 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 approach pathfinding and. Um, uh, and actually, I want I want uh, in, intended to touch on this a little bit uh, as well. Is so so essentially a couple of the the, the ways is you can hard code the coordinates. Hmm. Um, simple as that, you know, and and you just you just, you just get coordinate data get, that gets fed into a movement engine. Uh, that's very disk heavy, and uh, the memory side, you know, you could maybe buffer some of it in and out depending on your disk access speed, but definitely very disk heavy. If you're talking about long distance paths, um, you know, if you're talking about moving 10 tiles, five tiles, you know, it depends on the length of the path, but the longer the path, the more the data, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, what I was looking at in Knox or Chaos was, you know, a 32 by 32 town map, like, okay, we're, you know, got to transit from one side to the other, which, which was comparable to what was going on in Ultima 5 in terms of uh, path link. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is um, record flocking points, and a flocking point would be like uh, your 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 basic um, move, uh, NPC slash mob movement algorithm in an eight bit RPG is something that I call a magnet algorithm. I literally think I made that term up because I didn't I didn't see it anywhere, and I needed something to call it. But it's basically like uh, you got the player in the center of the screen and you've got like a mob or an NPC somewhere else, and uh, the algorithm runs for moving that, uh, I'm just gonna say N N NPC to be, uh, to encompass mobs as well as the friendly ones. Um, and there's an algorithm run that says, that basically says like, okay, what compare the XY coordinates of the NPC to the XY coordinates of the player. And if, if X, you know, is, uh, uh, you know, for the for the uh, NPC is less than X for the player. Okay, well then take a move towards you know the player or Y. You know is less than you know do the opposite. And and whether you check X first or Y first is going to you know cause a you know a predictable like well if they can they always go this way first. Uh, and and with that you know they if if they're just two fixed points on the screen the NPC can just do 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 find their way there. 
works perfectly except for when there's an obstacle in the way. Now here's where I need three hands. If there was an obstacle here, you know, in, you know, you got a wall, you got a mountain. Um, if, if the obstacle is more than like one tile wide, you know, uh, eventually, you know, the NPC is going to get caught on that and it's going to move to the left and it's going to move to the right and it's never going to find its way around. I mean, we've seen this in uh, like Ultima 3, but or, or also Ultima 4, but I remember when I played Ultima 3 a lot where, you know, you, 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 you can see it happening, you know, when you, you know, you're, you're mm -hmm. hiding from the guards and they're just on the other side of this wall and this, they'll just go eh, dude, up, you know, up and down, up and down. It was down, a game mechanic that we, we uh, yeah, exploited. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, so so that's like the magnet algorithm. So the flocking point method of pathfinding is you manually, as the designer, define uh, a handful of different flocking points along the path from point A to point B, and you design them uh, with obstacles in mind so that the NPC basically has one flocking point active at a time and, you know, flocking point one. Okay, so they're they're going to magnet algorithm their way over to flocking point one. Then okay, flocking point one is reached. So then, it, then in in its data table for flocking point, it'll switch over to flocking point two, and then the NPC will magnet algorithm over to flocking point two. So you've got to design your map and pick your flocking points in a way so that the NPC can find its way around the obstacles. Which, which it's a lot more difficult on the design side. Uh, it it also you know, there's there's disk space involved there because you got to store these data points for you know the the, the flocking points and uh, and things like that. Um, and uh, th those are the two I'm thinking of off the top of my head. Uh, or th well, we kind of talked about three there actually. Um, and and there, there's probably there's quite possibly some ones that uh, that I'm not thinking about. And and then there and then there's there's a star or something a star like. Uh, which which is uh, based on um, you've got you know your source point, your destination point, and you essentially call the algorithm, you give it the source and the destination, and then the algorithm crawls around the map building a database of coordinates and it figures it out. And after it figures it out and locks in a final path, then that final path, can be stored in memory uh, somewhere, and then the database gets flushed. Really, data tables, databases is, is certainly <laughs> more clarified than what it actually is. The data tables get flushed, and the algorithm can then calculate on a different set of uh, of coordinates. Um, so, so that that approach, what what I saw with that was uh, in when evaluating these these options, was that okay, well, that's going to be CPU intense doing these calculations, when's that going to happen? You know, they're not going to be fast. Um, and, and it's going to be memory intensive because there's going to be, you need to have these data tables uh, for, for building up the path coordinates as the algorithm's crawling around and figuring it all out. So uh, as was typical in uh, many design decisions in, in uh, Nox or Cast in this, in this kind of game, uh, it wasn't necessarily clear at the front end. It's like, okay, I see a couple of different solutions here and there's trade-offs to both uh you know from from a memory disk cpu uh perspective and and i had to think about those trade-offs think about it in the context of the game engine as it already existed because this wasn't the first thing you know that was done i by, by the time i was doing next uh a star or, or dealing with the pathfinding i already had um you know basically the graphics engine was already stood up you know you're, you we, we could walk around the map we could even enter towns, um, and uh, I think that was the extent of it. And then, and then the the pathfinding came in. But there were big chunks that were already laid there, so I had to look at all, all you know what memory had I already was already spoken for, and sure. you know the all all those things kind of played into it. And then I also considered like, okay, well, which path is most likely to create a scenario where um, I can push the envelope and uh, you How know long? do something a little. How sure. long are these paths that you're considering? Are they? It's easier to do a shorter path, obviously, right? From a memory perspective. So as you're figuring out what your memory yeah. budget, you're probably also figuring out the maximum length a character can walk a path as well, right? Yeah. Well, it, right. And and the the uh, I wanted to be able to go from one corner of a town to another on a thirty-two by thirty-two map. Ooh. Okay, that's a lot of memory. 
Yeah, my, that's my, my memory. I, I did a, a a Python A star thing at one time and um, an A star search, and there's a lot of variation in how people do this. So mine was just you know evaluating cost to move plus um, distance to location, and it starts to just flood fill everything. But it's always picking the lowest cost with like a min heap or a priority queue or whatever, how you ever you implement it. Yep. Um, yep. That was probably challenging to make a, a, a keep a, a min, min heap tree in 6502 well, right? Um, or did you do it differently? So, so, so much, so much of this was a hack. Okay, that, that, that's what that's how it should be. That's what <laughs> that's what that's why I say Knox A star is an A star ask algorithm because. Good. To, to do to get the functionality I wanted uh to do a, do it actually you know following like proper a star design it wouldn't have been able to have been done on the Apple II sure, with the, the 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 memory limitations so what we what we have is a star asking in the sense of okay well you know it's pathfinding it's an algorithm that tells you the path between two points it tells you you know, so that's an important characteristic of an A star. It does it by crawling around the map based on some criteria and building a table of coordinates. That's very A star. Um, and uh, but some of the details of exactly how does it make its decisions, uh, that's where it gets a bit hacky. Like, for example, um, you know, I would love to have done it where it's like, okay, ter all terrain has different weights and it considers that when it's deciding and all, of, you know, which something by the point you get to Sid Meier's Civilization one in the early 1990s, it was doing that. But that, but that was on the IBM PC. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're whole, we're whole, whole diff, you know, they, they, they built Rome on 640K a day is what, uh, you know, the book said there. So we're talking about 128 uh, in a one megahertz processor. So no, that wasn't happening. But what, what I did is uh, I hacked in some logic that basically said when it's uh, uh, evaluating the coordinates, because at any given point, you know, it's, it's in the, the, the brain of the algorithm is in one tile and it's looking at four different options fundamentally as to where it's going to move the, the algorithm brain to next. Um, uh, and and uh, without going back to the database saying, I'm stuck, I've got to, you know, start over somewhere else because it can crawl itself into a dead end, you know, and then none of the four options are good. And then it has to go, it parse the table and get back to uh, the, a, a logical start to re-exploring. But, but setting that aside, when it's, when it's doing its thing and what I call the algorithm brain is, is crawling around and, okay, so it's evaluating its four options. Uh, well, first of all, it's it's not going to take the one that was the last tile it evaluated. It's not going to won't do that. Throws that one out because that's where it came from. Um, and imagine the algorithm brain is like an NPC walking. Imagine it that way, you know. And if you're walking down a path, if you've got three three options, the uh, directions that are open, then there's no reason that you're going to go back the way that you came yet. So it throws out the direction it came from. So then it's down to three options. And then what I hacked in with some logic that basically said, if one of those options is a road tile or a floor tile, take that one uh, just instantly. The, fir the first road or floor tile, it, it, so it finds, you know, and it does it in like a north, south, east, west, you know, kind of uh, clockwise evaluation. Um, it's going to take that tile because chances are a road or floor is going to lead somewhere. Whereas if it starts wandering off on the grass or, you know, trees or some of this other terrain, who knows where it's going, you know? Did you ever find uh, yourself putting a non-road tile someplace just to force a character not to explore um, in its A-star time, a certain direction? Uh, no, I never, I never did anything okay. like that. But yeah, I mean, there, there could have been some... There's, certainly could 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 have fooled with uh with with the behavior but that way for sure um and uh um uh, yeah so so that that was the way of hacking in the the most important part of the functionality because the key there the key that i was solving to there was if uh in order to get a path that could be calculated from one corner of the map to the other or or close to it actually i only got it to be like three quarters of the way was the max distance but it was close close enough that from a design standpoint it rarely was a problem um 
but 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 to get uh, I didn't get there right away. You know, for the early iterations, it was nowhere close to that. And 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 this hack was one of the key things in getting there because if I let the algorithm just wander wherever without without any uh, cost waiting, it would run out of memory in the tables before it figured out how to get to the path in anything but the shortest most paths. Um, so that's what I was trying to solve to, but recognize that there isn't memory to actually do terrain waiting in any sort of a proper way. And this hack to go in there and basically, you know, just say, okay, if it's floor or 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 uh, or road, go with that. Sure. That hack was enough uh, to be able to get it efficiently moving towards the you know the destination enough to 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 get the you know the ability to calculate. Uh, that total pass along with other I mean there were other optimizations needed to get that too but this was a big one uh, for sure you know your book I think it was your book or maybe I heard you say this someplace else um, it takes a lot of time to compute this so you have to actually compute this in the background as the player is waiting to move and do other yeah. stuff um, which um, how yes. could it be otherwise but that's also sounds challenging to uh, put together yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly correct, and uh, that was one of the things that uh, it was not in the early iterations. You know, this this was solving to the CPU limitation. I, I had to um, basically design the the ACR algorithm as a recursive subroutine, uh, so so that uh, uh, it, it could get interrupted by the game loop when a key was pressed, and then kind of you know like get called back you know to where it was and some goofy stuff like that uh and the way i set it up was that uh uh it was guaranteed on every, on every iteration of the game loop and it calls a start it'll all would always calculate two path coordinates on whatever the current path was that it was working on um just to make sure that something got done so like if the player was holding down the movement key i wanted to make sure that each time a little bit got done. But after the two the two iterations went, then the code the, the, the code logic opened it up to say, hey, if, if it if it you know it it pulled uh you know the keyboard strobe on C000, you know, it just does an LDA C000. And, and if the value there, you know, uh it's like uh if the negative the, the value is negative, that means key press, and then it would exit out back to the game loop and let the player do what they were doing. And uh, so as a result, there's a big variability in what happens with the pathfinding, depending on, you know, when, when do you enter the town and what are you doing when you get there? Uh, everything is, uh, is, is based off of like the top of the hour. NPCs are supposed to be at their assigned anchors at the top of the hour. And uh, they stay there until the top of the next hour. So if you enter the town at the top of the hour uh, at zero, zero minutes, then you know the there there are are sixty game minutes, and I think it's like two turns per minute. Uh, I had to dial that in too. For the A star was what drove that. It's like so how how many moves can you make for one minute on the clock? And we're because we're doing this in these hour intervals, so it ended up being like two turns, two two tile moves per game minute. So we got sixty minutes times two, um, and and so that's one hundred twenty. And there's a minimum of two uh to uh you know tiles on a path calculated each time so that's 240 um so if the player enters at the top of the hour that's that's like the minimum amount of time that's there for a star to calculate a path if the player is holding down the movement key the entire time if they let off on that because they're looking at the pretty lake or you know uh saying like wow was that a cow over there what, you know and and they're not and their fingers not in the movement key then there's tons more time sure. So uh, the, the, end, the end result is as a practical matter, uh, you come in at the top of the hour and uh, A star is, it, it's gonna have enough time in any practical scenario to calculate through uh, the pass that it needs for the, it, it's calculating for the hour that's coming up. Yeah. Who's gonna move in the next hour? And, and there's usually gonna be three or, three or four transits uh, per hour. In, in a in a big in a big town and they can usually get through those if you enter the town at the top of the hour um or a little bit after wherever the other extreme is like okay you come in and it's like you know 11 50 a.m it's probably not going to have those calculations done by the time the clock strikes 12 and the way the game handles that 
is an NPC that's scheduled to transit whose path isn't done, uh, basically just ignores it. You know, it continues to do uh, a, a, basically a, a random movement algorithm around its anchor point, just like it normally does. Yeah. Uh, and, and it just continues in that mode until its path is done. And once its path is done, no matter what time it is, it then executes off of that path. So it will happen eventually. And I thought, That's okay, cool. so here, just simply by going down this path, I found a limitation that was actually a feature and a way to push things, you know, in ahead uh, from a gameplay perspective, because essentially what all this means, you know, I'm showing you behind the curtain, but from a gameplay perspective, what this feels like is there's a little bit of randomness to how NPCs yeah, move. That's good. You know, maybe the merchant, you know, doesn't show up on time and like, oh boy, what except, happened? You know, did he stop at the pub and you know except hit, for that one guard that, that had me stumped? You have you have a guard in some place which is blocking me. And he's there all for but like one hour or one I, I can't remember. Uh, it took me forever to figure that out. <laughs> So that there's nothing random about that. There is only one little time where he's gone, and you can walk that path. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, the, uh, you're you're Harad Keep. Yeah, uh, probably. Yeah, the the, the Sorry, that was part of the puzzle, um, where 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 it's a particular mm -hmm. uh, particular reason for it. But um, uh, yeah, I, I, in in general, there's this randomness that uh, the the you know gets in there and. And and now let's compare to baseline, you know, and this actually this this touches on something else I wanted to. So um, one of the fun things that I got to do uh, during development uh, of the Oxacar algorithm is is of course I, I I had to get I had to learn more about how pathfinding was done in different games and more specifically Ultima Five, um, you know, since the the you know the goal was kind of like okay well let's let's move beyond that 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 was the pathfinding example in a you know, uh, in, in an RPG at that point. So uh, I spent a lot of time dinkering around in Ultima 5 and, and basically harassing NPCs. Um, yeah. I would, you know, I, I would figure out, okay, so here's the merchant's house and here's the merchant's shop. Here's the path they take. And I would like stand in the path of that merchant and 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 block them just to see would they go around me? What would they do? And no, they 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 would stand there the if, until you ran out of food and died. You know, if you blocked, you know, the the path. And and I noticed that they they always did it at the exact same time of day. There was no variance in it at all. Uh, and they always uh, and they never moved around the player. Those those were the characteristics that I noticed, uh, as well as that uh, if if you uh, barricaded the like the 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 inn where you got the innkeeper. If you barricade the inn with with uh, tables by pushing them around so that they can't get out, uh, they 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 basically uh, can't get out. There there's no way they'll be trapped. And but if you like wait for a while, um, uh, I think to, to wait, it's like there needs to be a, a bed nearby. So I had to do this in a specific location, um, where I could like trap the merchant and then go, you know, sleep for a few hours in a bed and then come back and see, oh, he had disappeared. He magically had, you know, reappeared where he was supposed to reappear. So I was like gathering like all these characteristics of, of, uh, of this and, uh, um, concluded that, uh, Likely, what Ultima Five was doing for pathfinding was hard coded coordinates, um, because if it, if it was if it was if it was flocking points, they 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 would have moved around me when I was blocking them. Um, so it was I think likely hard coded coordinates, which is disc heavy, and uh, that can be shortened up by short you know the. The length of the paths. I wasn't seeing NPCs going from corner A to corner B. You know, they were much shorter, which would lessen the disc requirements. Um, and and then additionally, ultimately, everything's a trade-off. You know, uh, you you can allocate more disc to storing more coordinates if you have less of something else. And you know, there's all sorts of little micro decisions like that that go on in there. But that's 
Uh, I, I I have not looked at the source code to you know to confirm this, but I think that that's how also if I probably did it was 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 hard coded coordinates. Um, in any event, uh, so going down the A star path, um, I what when I noticed what I was wrangling with what what first I was thinking is this limitation. It's like well, but if the player walks in at eleven fifty, you know you're going to have NPCs that aren't transiting when they normally would. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. No, this is going to introduce some randomness to it. Um, so, so that's that's really the um, and, and and there's a couple other examples of it, but the uh, the the uh, one of the uh, sort of uh, pushing the envelope forward things about the Knox path finding is that NPCs uh, do not they do not uh, transit necessarily always at the same time. Uh, which 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 you can imagine creatively as far as like well did they sleep in you know did the merchant stop off at the pub on the way in or you know there, there's a variety of you know, things that you can imagine around that which are fun you know uh, having this little extra randomness in there um, and then uh, and then additionally another way was that uh, inspired by my harassment of NPCs in Ultima Five. Uh, where where they would just you know you you're blocking their path and sure. and they'll just come up to you and and, and stand there they, they will never move around you they will never say anything they'll never do anything so I wrote some code in Knox Archaeus to detect uh, that condition and number one uh, have the the A star uh, instead of just because we're now in the movement engine and and it's basically reading off the the final path. Uh, stored in memory somewhere that A-star calculated. So the movement engine, when it's basically just peeling off the coordinates one by one that A-star had provided, uh, if it detects that it's blocked um, and it's blocked by uh, the player or another NPC or something like that, because uh, theoretically it should never be blocked by a wall or something like that. Um, but it, uh, it's uh, it basically, if it's blocked, it then deploys a flocking point algorithm. It like sets a flocking point a couple of tiles ahead okay. on the pre the predetermined A star path. It'll just like skip, uh, you know, you know X register index plus three, you know, sort of thing. No. Grab, you know, the 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 path coordinates, you know, three three increments down. Declare that that's a flocking point, and then it'll move based on a magnet algorithm to that flocking point, which means that if, you know, a a, a, the player is one tile, an NPC is one tile, and a magnet algorithm to a flocking point can figure out how to get around a one tile obstacle because it's gonna, even, even, even if it's, you're on the same north-south axis, a magnet algorithm is smart enough to decide, okay, I, I'm where I need to be north-south, but I'm blocked, so I'm either gonna move to the east or to the west and hope that my way is clear in one of those two. It can it can figure that out. Now, the player can be a real wise ass and say, okay, the NPC moved, you know, uh, to the east to try to get around me. Well, I'm going to move to the east too. Yeah. And then the NPC is going to move to the west. Well, I'm going to move to the west too. Uh, and I anticipated this because I thought this is exactly what I would do, you know, in the spirit of how much fun I had harassing NPCs in Ultima 5. Um, and uh, so I wrote some code to detect player harassment as defined by that pattern. It basically just tallies the number of times uh, in a row, you know, that the player was blocking them. And if it, it, it you know, gets to like three or something, uh, then, then, it, then, it, then it basically prints some, some text. Yeah. And the first text that I have a screenshot of this somewhere you know, was beat it or I'll call the brute squad. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Everybody encounters that. Changed, the uh the annoyed text. That that's a great I, feature. I changed it to something else, but you know, did you, you did encounter that did you Yeah, I did counter text. Um I don't know if it's that exact phrase. It's been a couple of years, but yeah. Yeah, no, that was very yeah, cool. Yeah, I don't I don't so, know the exact phrase either, but yeah. You were saying like uh you know your indexing comment your X register, you just go forward um a couple times. I, I assume this means that um you don't have any pathfinding at all in your gigantic 256 by 256 dungeons, right? Because that's 
that's too big, right? You said 32 by 32 earlier. So there's no pathfinding right. in the large dungeons. Okay, that makes sense. I, for those who don't know, but, the size but, of the overworld in Ultima 4 was 256 squared. That could be just a dungeon level in Nox Arceus. So this it is a big, big game. Um, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there... Uh, everything you said is accurate, and and, and I won't give too much. Uh, I want to give too much away here. I will say that there are a couple of areas in the underworld, uh, or which or dungeon levels, if you will, uh, where it's where we're two fifty six by two fifty six maps. Uh, there are a couple areas where pathfinding does occur with a star, and the way that I did that is. Um, there, there is a tile set. Uh, there, there is a special small map tile set, thirty-two by thirty-two map tile set that is used uh, just for a couple of areas in the underworld where uh, I basically embedded small thirty-two by thirty-two maps within the the big two fifty-six by two fifty-six. And I mean, they're technically all separate maps, but but. Uh, uh, because it's a special tile set, uh, I, I, I what, when I when I was in the thirty-two by thirty-two map, I had access to stuff like cavern walls and cavern floor. Okay. So I make it look like you basically cross a transition point, walking down a cavern hallway, and you hit a transition point, and it actually takes you into a thirty-two by thirty-two map. Okay. Which has all which which basically has the town engine running, and it has a star and all the other capabilities, but it still looks like you're in the cavernous, you know, underworld environment, which means I could then place NPCs and make them transit around. And I, if I tell you the area where that does this, you'll 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 remember. But I don't want I don't want to spoil it for anybody. While we're talking about um, these giant levels, you have a you mentioned in your book um, again. Getting back to this book, your viewport I think is what you called it. The the portion of the play field screen that is dedicated to drawing tiles as a por as opposed to the portion of the screen that's displaying statistics and things like that and clearly the the larger that gets the slower it is to update and you have a 11 by 17 tile set uh, right. dimensionality to that and apparently it was challenging uh to get that to go fast enough um can we pivot over to what what kind of challenges you had and how you solved that because that that's sure. I've seen a lot of games and some of them have very tiny ones as well and you know they're picked that way um, specifically um, for performance reasons and you have a gigantic one so how do you get that to go uh, efficiently? Yeah, yeah, that that's uh, in fact if if uh, if I could why don't I just uh, uh, boot up Knox or Chaos Quick and show the size oh. of, the, of the screen? I think. Uh, oh, let's hope uh, this works. This, yeah. this, so there you go. You got the screen up. Yeah. So just to illustrate here, so this is eleven tiles uh, uh, deep by seventeen tiles wide, and uh, there's the, basically the only amount of the screen that is not used for the tile map is is two tile widths here uh, on the very far right for a little bit of uh, information. And as David was saying, uh, what was typical in uh, the RPGs of of the day would be. Uh, they would have something. Uh, the actually probably one of the larger would would be uh, Ultima had uh, eleven uh, eleven by nine, so the same depth, uh, but width would only come over maybe about uh, more like half of the way, and and then uh, the, uh, the the remainder of the screen, you know, that's where you had your character stats and a little scrolling text window, things like that. Some games even went further with it. Uh, where it was just like a viewport in like the, a square in the upper left. Um, and uh, the, Nox or Chaos was able to, to, one question might be is like, okay, well, where's the, uh, uh, where do you, where's the stats information and all of that kind of stuff. And uh, that's another topic we're going to get into. Um, so trust that there, there is an elegant way that that's handled, but uh, talking about the, the, uh, the, the technical topic that David, that you had raised is like, Okay, so there's a lot more uh, uh, CPU intensity, you know, to what's going on here with a map this size because um, every time the player moves, uh, do we have sound? 
I don't know if someone's going to come through, but why not? Every time the player moves, uh, you know, all, you know, all those graphics uh, need to move, you know, somehow or another, as well as animation is running. Um, you know, there's just a lot more, uh, the more, bigger, bigger, the viewport of the map, you know, the more that's, uh, that's going on. Um, so yeah, this, this definitely was a challenge and, uh, there were several, I wrote a couple, I know I re I rewrote the graphics engine top to bottom at least once. Sure. And, uh, then, uh, there were several optimizations that I did, uh, along the path uh to uh to get here one one of them was and and this this, this one i would not i would not call like a, a a first by by any means one was instead of redrawing the screen every time that the player moves uh instead uh basically do a direct copy in video memory and scroll the the, the data and video memory either up down left or right and then only draw a row or a column of tiles that's uh, on the edge of the screen in the direction that the player is moving. Yeah. Um, and and I know that's you know that that's been done before, but that was definitely something where it's like I did I didn't have that in initially, and it was like really painfully slow yeah. drawing the screen every time. Um, and uh, so I got the screen scrolling in there, and at that point it it, it was. It was like um, how I would describe it that it, it was in a state where it wasn't as crisp as Ultima. You know, you could feel a little bit of lag, and uh, you know, and from from a modern standpoint, I mean, there there's there's like you know people that on Steam that, that that play this game that never played games back in the '80s, but you know are into retro stuff for one reason or another. Maybe they came in in the '90s or whatever. You know they play they 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 play it and to them it still feels laggy because they're they're used to you know much more modern system response times but uh, uh, you know Ultima Five was my baseline and and it was like you know what I was aiming for was bigger map bigger map viewport because that's new that's innovative that one hadn't been done uh, but it's like no 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 it's got to still be at least as fast when you move as Ultima Five or you know, mission wasn't totally accomplished there. That was kind of the thing. So when I got the screen scrolling part of it uh, dealt with in with the video memory copy, um, it was no longer like okay, you watch, you, you look at your watch as the screen draws, but it still was, it still felt laggy as compared to Ultima Five, um, and uh, it was actually kind of later in the process when uh, when this happened, it was a teammate of mine that really pointed that out. You know. And uh, I said, hey, you know, this this really can can we do some more on this? Because it's really just not quite there. And I'm like, ah, you know, I'm focusing on like 10 different things at that time and 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 come back to this problem. And it's like, OK, so what can we do on speed? And um, what what the final piece of the puzzle was is uh, I, I, I counted the clock cycles uh, for the. Sure. Uh, the screen scrolling loop. I mean, I literally printed out the source code and for every op code wrote down the number of clock cycles on each op code, taking into consideration whether a page boundary was page boundary was clause or was it an absolute or uh, an, an, an immediate, you know, mode op code, you know, form, all of that and wrote down the number of clock cycles, added them up and uh, the total number of clock cycles was something like 500,000, 600,000, something. I don't remember the exact number. And I, and, 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 uh, it's, it's, I don't, I don't know if I've ever talked about this in an interview, but I know I've, I've talked with individual people about it. I, I, whatever number I give is probably give, give or take a hundred thousand in either direction on sure. it. But, you know, it's so, it was somewhere approaching of like, okay, we're, we're, we're talking about a half second here because yeah. one megahertz CPU, a hundred thousand clock uh, or a million clock cycles per second. We're talking about uh, approximately a half second is going by, um, you know, just, just when you, when you move and that's noticeable, you, you know, by eight bit standards is noticeable next to, you know, uh, Ultima five. Um, and, uh, so, so my mission, of course, was okay. How can we cut clock cycles? 
And, you know, there's a little bit of nibbling around the edges that I did and this and that. But here was the big one. Um, ultimately, a screen scrolling routine that's doing these video memory copies is a series of nested loops. Uh, if, 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 if it's not, unless it's unrolled. Sure. You know, you could unroll, you could unroll all the loops, and that's one way to to but get you some have speed. The space but for that. that would absolutely have blown up the memory yeah, requirements exactly. to a point. It's uh, we're writing a tech demo at that point. You know, <laughs> of like how fast can we make a map scroll? You know, as opposed to actually, yeah. you know, we got to have room for the game somewhere. So uh, unrolling the loops uh, was out, and unless we unrolled. You know, uh, you could say, well, could you unroll part of them or this? Yeah, there wasn't really a good sweet spot doing some kind of a uh, do, doing it half assed as opposed to full assed uh, on the on the unroll side. So uh, what I found, though, and doing this analysis, though, this clock cycle analysis, uh, what, what it illustrated for me, though, was just the sheer number of nested loops that I had, because when you get right down to it, uh, when 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 the when that video memory copy is happening, you know you're only copying one byte at a time. Yeah. You know, so so you ultimately have a routine. The lowest level loop is 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 basically copying um, uh, like a tile's worth of bytes or something, and uh, or, and or, and maybe it was only a half a time. It may have even been less than that. Obviously, we're going to copy more than one byte at a time. We're going to copy some series, and that's the lowest level loop. And, a, and it was either a tile's worth or half a tile's worth, something like that. And uh, and then above that, the next level loop, let's let's just say it was a tile that we were copying. Uh, the, the, the next level above that is like, okay, what is going to be a loop that's calling that, you know, copy the video memory for a tile over and over again until we've copied a column. Or we've copied a row of tiles, um, and then above that is going to be okay. Well, we're 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 going to do you know a screen of tiles, or we're going to do a screen of tiles from um, you know there were some variances depending on whether you were moving uh, north, south, east, or west as far as what what was cop being copied and some things like that. So so we end up with you know nested loops. So I go down to that very bottom nested loop, the one that's copying like a tile or maybe half a tile's worth of, of screen bytes and a tile, you know, we're talking about uh, 32 bytes of memory is, is a tile, uh, is, is how it's uh, positioned on the Apple II. And this is for uh, 14 pixels by 16 pixels is 32 bytes. Why 14 and not 16? Well, that's because of the Apple has a color bit as bit seven. Um, and, uh, so, so you got, you got horizontally, you got two of those, you know, uh, you're, you're two screen byte wides on a tile, you lose two bytes to the color bit. So you got 14 pixels by 16, but it's still 32 bytes to make that up anyway. Uh, so the loop that is doing that copy, what, uh, I, 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 you know, basically theorized and then implemented was I'm like, well, what if we do some self-modifying code here and, instead of having traditional loop overhead where we've got a loop counter and then we're checking the loop counter and based on the value of the loop counter, then we're branching to the top of the loop. Uh, you know, that takes, you know, a handful of clock, clock cycles to do that. And instead of that loop overhead, what I did instead was did some self-modifying code uh, so that uh, basically it would, um, uh, not have to increment the memory address that it was writing to because the STA opcode uh, plus address on um, in, basically instead of the loop overhead uh, to, to, to deal with that, I would just like modify the address in memory that the STA is writing to. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty and, frequent. You'll be, you'll be like, am I going to do this as a, this level of indirection in zero page, or am I going to do self-modifying code? And you always have to make the call uh, each time. Yeah. 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 And, and, and any, and any you know, obviously you and any uh, your viewers that are intimately familiar with 6502 know exactly what I'm talking about with the self-modifying sure. code. Just wanted to, you know, 
to round it out for for all listeners wanted to give a little bit of uh context around it is, is the overworld uh, all in memory at once or do you, are you bringing it in as you're moving around i assume you're bringing it uh, in right the overall uh, i'm sorry can, can you repeat that the overworld itself are you bringing that in as you move around or is it all it's not all in memory oh. at one time right um uh, yeah so that's a great question and uh uh, I, I just want to finish off one oh, thing. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. And then we'll dive into that. Uh, so just wanted to say that, uh, so, so that was the modification of the self-modifying code at the bottom nested loop in the stack of nested loops. And even though it only shaved off a couple clock cycles, literally just like something like two, three sure. clock cycles uh, from, for, from the, the, the iteration of that loop, it, it, it was like that loop, loop took like 12 clock cycles that bottom loop, and and then after the self-modifying code, it was like nine or 10 clock cycles. So it was two or three clock cycles per iteration of the bottom loop, which means the savings was two or three clock cycles times, well, how many times is that loop called? Yeah. <laughs> and it's called a whole bazillion times. And the end result is we go from uh, something like five or 600,000 clock cycles on the, uh, the screen scrolling down to something like two or 300,000. Again, I'm probably off by plus plus or minus 100,000, but it was just a huge chunk that just bam, got knocked out of there. Yep. And at that point, um, you know, the uh, even with the, with this, this huge map uh, compared to what was typically done, uh, we were getting this real nice uh, crisp movement rate. So uh, for example, So the overworld is 256 by 256, and uh, it is broken down into zones that are 16 by 16 tiles each. And there's a regional map that consists of nine zones. Uh, so it's like, uh, in other words, it's like three zones by three zones. You're in the center, um, and then there's three zones above you, three zones below you, one zone to the east, one zone to the west. Uh, that's the regional map. And so that's enough that you can never, you can never, um, uh, well, it's enough to make it so that you can never see off it. What ends up happening is that uh, uh, to put a button on your, uh, your original question is, so, so that regional map is the only thing that's in memory. The rest is on disk. It, uh, uh, the data, the map data is read off of disk in a compressed format and uh, it gets uh, nine zones get read in and and each each zone as it comes in gets uncompressed, put somewhere in memory. So the end result is nine uncompressed okay. zones in memory. So I got a trade -off. And, I got a trade off question for you uh, on that then. Um, in your book, you're saying you're using ZX7. I had to go look that up. Apparently that came out of the sure. ZX Spectrum world. Uh, they've been doing that. It's an LZ derivative. And so if you're compressing map data, um, I could see that having to decompress it slows you down, but also having fewer bytes to read off of disk speeds it up. So I imagine the IO having to read less is the greater savings than the cost of having to decompress a memory. And overall you win with the compression from a performance, not just a storage perspective as you're moving around. Is that true or did you measure that trade-off? Yeah, yeah, that, that that's, that's true. Uh, uh, especially when we're talking about floppy. You know that that's uh, slow access time on floppy. Uh, yeah, you want to get that data down as small as as possible, and yeah. uh, the, the the CPU overhead to run the uncompressed. Yeah, that, it was a good trade off from oh, a yeah. CPU perspective <laughs> and a win on this perspective. So, yeah, for for sure. Um, and uh, the last, as long as we're on the subject, the last thing I was going to mention is um, in this regional map of, of uh, three by three zones and the players in the middle. As the player moves, their position floats within the regional map. And until they get to a certain point, uh, 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 there, there's, there's like a rectangle or a square inside of this um, three by three zone map, where if you go past the edge of that uh, threshold, then 
you trigger a zone transition and a new set of zones is loaded into memory and in 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 the zones that you're in get shuffled down in this three by three map uh you know it's essentially scrolling the zones uh and, and it's so that you never uh look off the edge of the map data because if you look off the edge of the map data in in a uh eight bit tile rpg you 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 see a bunch of random tiles uh with which you know many of us have seen like when a game you know crashes or you put the wrong you know disc in the drive on some of the early games in uh in like ultima yeah. 4 you put walking around in britannia put in the underworld disc and all of a sudden you see this uh collage of of, of, of tiles that appear in the game in some insane order you know that was a great way to get graphic. that was a great way to get special items in bard's tale in the store you just throw in a different yeah. disc yeah right yeah because it, it could be anything you know and and what you're seeing there is uh a graphical expression of the hex values in a part of memory that the game did not intend to be map data. It's just, it could be part of the program, you know? Um, but And that never happens in, in a properly functioning game in Nox or Chaos, for example, because uh, there's these zone transition boundaries that are set up that once you cross that, you know, it refreshes uh, the regional map and memory shuffles you around. You never see it. Um, Etc. So, and even on floppy disk, when that zone transition happens, even on floppy disk, um, you you really you don't notice any lag. You know that you just briefly there will be a hit to the disk. You'll hear it. You'll see the light flash. Yeah. But it, it doesn't really interrupt. Um, you know the speed that you're moving around. Well, topic to put on the stack because I I know you may not be finished with this one. Just so we don't forget. Oh, uh, I am. I am, okay, I'm done. So you had to stream a couple of things. I say stream, I mean the appearance of low latency as something as retrieved from the floppy disk. Um, some of your spell effects or something had to be very quickly streamed from the floppy disk. Is that right, or was that is that not the case? Okay. Yeah, th that's absolutely that's absolutely and, correct. And you had to do all kinds uh, yeah. of cu custom floppy disk controller stuff for this game as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, or okay? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Um, the um, the Apple II floppy disk drive, uh, as I understand it, is n notably faster in disk access than the Commodore floppy disk right. drive. Even so, it was still a significant bottleneck from a development standpoint in what could be done. And uh, when Nox or Chaos started out, uh, I, I um, was was doing things in in a fairly, uh, I guess, conventional way, and I, I well, and I want to point out at this point that if I remember correctly, the Commodore disk drive has a uh, excuse me a disk controller like built onto the drive. Yeah, it has its own 6502 processor on yeah, the drive, so exactly. you can send it arbitrary code to execute in parallel and independent of the Commodore, yet still be able to coordinate, which was at the heart of some interesting copy protection schemes at one point. I, I bet, exactly. Hmm. Um, so on the Apple II, uh, it, it does not have that. There is no uh, hardware disk controller on the floppy drive. Uh, there is no second 6502 processor on the none of that so so essentially the uh the drive controller is a piece of software in the apple II's memory and uh that that interacts with with the hardware which uh, to your point well, there was some a lot of interesting copy protection that was uh done based around you know all of that going on um so basically the uh uh, like like uh, uh, Commodore games, I would expect large commercial scale Apple II games in the 1980s uh, did not use an operating system. Uh, they kicked the operating system out of memory and uh, used a bootloader uh, to uh, you know just uh, you know run run the game on on bare metal, and uh, uh, that that's uh, exactly uh, how Nox or Chaos works. And when when I uh somewhere probably in the uh first year of the project um uh, well in i know in the first year initially in the first year of the project i actually was running it through dos but i but i i, I knew that that was wasn't ultimately going to cut it you know uh because of knowing how it was done 
uh, and and so I set out to write a bootloader to uh, to kick DOS out of memory and uh, get to that level of functionality. And that was a really interesting and fun project because at the time um, I didn't really know anybody in the Apple II community, and uh, there 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 are a few people out there in the Apple II community that know how to do that kind of programming, but I didn't know they existed. I didn't know who they were. And I was like literally spelunking through old news group postings uh, from CompuServe, you know, dated 1990, 1989, you know, which were all rolled into Google groups. And I'm like spelunking through these things, picking up little bits of information on like, what's an Apple II ROM? How does it do the handoff uh, to, uh, you know, essentially code on a floppy, you know, disk and and then what does that code need to do and um uh, and 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 essentially the bootstrapping process, you know, uh what what which uh, I, I don't know how it works on the Commodore side, but I'm guessing it's probably fairly similar where uh you know ROM is going to you know read uh track zero, sector zero, you know, one 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 spot on 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 a small amount of data off a disk, it's gonna read that into memory. And whatever's in that spot of memory better be able to take it from there. And uh, so the, you know, the code that you put in track zero sector zero is, uh, you know, basically just enough code to like read in another sector. And it can't be more than that because uh, of, of some reason that I don't remember. And then, and then, you know, you like read in another sector and then that gets you uh, enough code so that, all right, now, now you've got a, a enough of a disk controller to be able to read in multiple sectors at a time. And you just keep, you, you're, you're just in these stages, you're you're reading in bits and pieces of, of a disk controller until you finally get to a point that you've got a fully functioning disk controller. And then you can actually read in whatever you want, uh, such as uh, the game loader and actually get down to the business of getting the game in memory. And there's all these different steps to it. And, and I figured out how to piece that together um from we, we don't have any of that so it's interesting to hear about it so anyway keep going oh okay <laughs> so you you can you get to skip all that fun. oh yeah there's no uh, gossip on the disc okay. um so uh so so in any event um uh I, I i got that far with it uh basically to the level that uh the 1980s games were for on the apple II for the most part um and 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 it was used in, in the disk controller code that I was um, bootstrapping into memory. Uh, I had to write some, you know, little customizations and massages of it to to get it all to line up right, so to speak. But but the final code that was in there, like the full disk controller, um, that was basically like a disk controller that Steve Wozniak wrote in 1979. Um, and uh, the the uh, uh, but I couldn't st I couldn't start with that. I had to break it down into these small chunks to do these different stages. And that that's where uh, the kind of the technical complexity came in of coding this without without a roadmap. But anyway, the end result was this basically Steve Wozniak 1979 disc controller that was like what all Apple II games were using. So comparable performance, et cetera. And that's then that was pretty much how I was intending on, you know, rolling with it. And uh, then I met up with uh, somebody who uh, goes by the alias uh, Q Kumba. Uh, and uh, yeah, yes, yeah. You, it you, is you, cucumber. You, you know, <laughs> yes, yeah, that's his little joke with it. Is, that, uh, that, guy is, is, that guy is bright, by the way. Um, I, I was when I was working on my 6502 book, a um, lot of value when he when he proved that for me. So yeah, you got you got a smart one yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, he he is, uh, and it's not just me saying this. Uh, he 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 has been referred to as basically uh, one one of the best sixty five hundred two assembly language uh, programmers in the world ever. Um, it, it would probably you know take like John Carmack or or Becky Berger or Waz himself to give him a run. Uh, he just like thinks like the computer. He can run a sixty five hundred two assembly complex. 6502 program in his head, tracking the register values and the memory values and the bit flips and come up with a result on the end and convert it from hex to decimal on the fly. And, 
Uh, and I actually saw him doing that once uh, in a in a, like a at Kansas Fest at a copy protection cracking session mm -hmm. that he and 4 a.m. another famous Apple II hacker uh, were, were doing. And and it was uh, and and it, it was just like watching him do it was was a work of art. And uh, some somebody figured out what Peter was doing. Peter, Peter's his real name, Kikuma's real name. Figured out what he was doing. You know, running the program in his head and doing these conversions, and and he was like, you know, aud giving audibles to 4 a.m. You know, as he was looking at his console that 4 a.m. was using to inform what he was doing. Someone figured some someone figured out what he was doing. I didn't quite catch it. He said, like, Peter, did you just you know like run the program in your head and convert the the the, the hex to decimal and flip it around and spit it out back the other and. And he's kind of a he's just kind of a shy, quiet guy by nature. And so he didn't say anything. He just kind of smiled as if to say, like, well, what is there another way to do it? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I eventually meet Kukuma. And he suggested, well, you know, I I could write uh a uh a Protoss driver. Uh, for for your game so that you know you, you, you could run the whole thing on Protoss and um, you know then you could use uh, hard drive disk images not just floppy and there'd be all these benefits and all that and at this point I knew his reputation because uh, we're on Compsys Apple II where, where the, the best of the best Apple II uh, you know hackers kind of hang out and uh, I, I knew him by reputation like okay this is a serious guy um, didn't fully understand yet quite how brilliant he was, but, um, uh, you know, and he's making this proposal. And at first I'm thinking like, how can that possibly work? Protoss, you know, takes up this huge chunk of memory. It's basically as big as, as, as regular DOS. There's no way that there's room in memory for that. Uh, unless you, you know, design the game around it to begin with, but then, you know, that's trade-offs. You're giving up something else and the games back in the day didn't have the operating system in memory. So that's not a trade-off I want to make. And, and then, and, and eventually I, 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 you know, but knowing his reputation, I agreed to like, okay, let's talk about it. And eventually I figured out that actually, no, he wasn't talking about having the Protoss operating system in memory. He was talking about something else entirely that I knew a little bit about from reading the book Beneath DOS, the one that is the, you know, uh, Beneath Knox or Cast would be the homage to. And um, Beneath DOS talks about basically how does DOS interface with the hardware? And as a result, it, it, it's basically telling you like, well, if you wanted to interface directly with the hardware, Here's in theory how you would do it. And I say theory for a reason. So for example, it's got a chapter that talks about how uh, a bunch of what they call latch toggles work for the, uh, the, the floppy disk drive, which are basically soft switches in memory um, up in ROM that it's if, if, you, if you, you do like an LDA or STA to uh, one of these addresses, yeah. uh, one of these soft switch addresses, that that, that something happens because if, the computer. If, if you stroke, if you stroke the I/O register that is memory mapped, you get an effect irrespective of whatever the operand was with the instruction. Exactly. Yeah. So on the Apple II, uh, there's a series of these soft switches in memory that are the essentially it's it, 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 it is the. It is the software interface point to the hardware that that was built in by the hardware designers. It's like here's we're exposing the hardware to you in the form of these dozen or so soft switch addresses. That's uh, that's basically how how it works with all of the Apple II hardware on some level is is it's all exposed through soft switches or in, in the case of video memory, there's just a chunk of memory that's reserved. That's like. The hardware is connected to it, and whatever you pit, put there is interpreted as values that you know the hardware uh, run runs out the video port. But uh, but anyway, so for the disk drive, so uh, since the controller is software, these latch toggles. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna. The book calls them latch toggles. Yeah. No, uh, no problem. Yeah. 
soft switches, latch toggles, treat those as in, 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 in the same thing synonymously because they are. Um, so the book talks about essentially um, using these uh, soft switches to do things like power up the drive motor on the floppy drive thing and then and then move the drive arm stop the drive arm from moving you know and it takes a bit for it to slow down and you know actually land somewhere yep. and if you forget where uh, you the software if you forget where the drive arm is then here's a latch toggle to tell the drive arm to go bang against the side of the disc case in which makes the grinding noise you know that uh uh, we, we've all heard on the Apple too. I assume Commodore disc. Maybe they oh, don't. Do they? No. Oh, we do. We got the grind noise. They do. So imagine it's for a similar reason. In the Apple II, it's the the software has told the disc controller software has told the drive arm to basically move until it hits the edge of the drive case, because then it knows where it is, and then it can find track zero from there, sort of thing. So this is the like granular level uh, that that. Uh, uh, you have to interface with the disk drive at a software level uh, in the Apple II because there is no hardware disk controller. You've got to write one in software. And when you write a disk controller in software on the Apple II, these are the kinds of activities that, that, that you're doing. Oh, and then, of course, there's a soft switch for, yes, let's actually read a byte off of the drive head or let's place a byte on the drive head to be written you get you know you have that too but <laughs> you've got all this other stuff you have to deal with before you're doing that and so the book beneath dos talks about this stuff and it came with an important pref uh, uh, preface to it it basically said well so if you want to interface directly with the floppy drive uh in theory this is how you do it uh, but we don't really actually recommend that anybody does this because Wozniak took care of this in 79, just use his stuff. <laughs> so, um, and this was like one of the monumental things that, that, that Wozniak did uh, yeah. was, was to, you know, as, as you may know, is, you know, de developing that floppy drive and then writing this uh, controller for it and everything else. It was just, it was totally groundbreaking. Um, so, uh, I had read this book before this conversation with Q Kumba, so I had some kind of general sense of this. And, and, and as I got talking to him, I started to understand that, no, he's not talking about having Protoss in them. He's talking about writing a drive controller, a new drive controller that uses the soft switches described in this book, but writing it in such a way that it would understand the Protoss file system format so that without Protoss in memory, we could read a disk image that had been basically formatted by Protoss. And the reason that that's significant is that, because uh, I know Protoss, I mean, we're, we're Commodore is a whole different, you know, has a whole different set of stuff on this. So to, to, to bridge the worlds together, the reason, and, and I think, and I think this can be appreciated, uh, is Protoss. What comes with Protoss is because that, that 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 was that was like the 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 last Apple uh, Apple II DOS iteration, and what comes with Protoss is that well, it understands how to read uh, hard thirty two meg hard drive images, for example, and uh, and 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 Protoss has a bunch of tools that were written for it, modern day tools in the Apple II community. You you can uh, fire up a tool on a Mac or Windows PC and open up a Protoss uh, ordered disk image and look at what files are on it. Oh, and Protoss has the concept of files uh, built right into uh, its file system structure. And uh, in, in, with, with DOS 3.3, uh, uh, which is what came before Protoss, um, uh, the, the, you, 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 could, you could basically have files if you had DOS in memory, but, but the disk controller uh, that, that was wrote in 1979, it didn't understand files. Yeah. So pro, the, the, Pro, the Protoss, uh, uh, ordered file file structure 
or a file system had file names embedded and things like that. So what Cucumba was proposing was using, uh, writing a new controller, use the latch toggles, get down to the lowest possible level with it, but write it in a way that it could read a Protoss disk image, which would mean that uh, we could use all of these Apple II community development tools that were based around uh, Protoss uh, formatted images, as well as ultimately end up with a game that would be runnable both on floppy and on a hard drive disk image, which at the time didn't, I didn't appreciate the importance of that at the time, and I certainly do now. Um, so once I, once the light bulb for me came on that that's what he was proposing doing, my mind was just blown because having read Beneath DOS, uh, I understood the monumental it's a heavy you know, lift. nature it's of what he was talking about. What's that? It's a heavy lift. Have, absolutely heavy lift. Uh, but I knew enough of his reputation at this point that I was like, you know, if anybody can can do this, this is the guy, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I was like, I I'm in. Let's 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 do this. And over the course of the summer of I believe it was 2016, we basically worked together on writing what is now known as Pro RWTS. And uh, you know, he he had the mastermind vision for you know how it was going to work and was writing the code uh, for, uh, you know, for doing it and would send the code over to me and I would test it uh, on various different, you know, kinds of hardware, observe, you know, uh, bug patterns, report them back to him, uh, you know, rinse and repeat, essentially. And uh, it was a very symbiotic relationship because um, he only had a single Apple II computer with one floppy drive hmm. and we were trying you know, to write this, you know, this controller so that it would work on uh, a two drive system as well as, you know, on not just the Apple IIe, but also the 2C uh, and 2GS in compatibility mode. I had all that hardware, he didn't. <laughs> and as well as, and to, to, to truly test it uh, beyond, beyond just like basic testing, well, the true test was, can we stand up Nox or Chaos with this as the, uh, as the controller. So after we sort of uh, code golf back and forth to get the basics working, you know, then I was like, okay, I took the code and and swapped out the WAS controller for uh, for for the new one. And of course, it didn't work, and you know, went back and forth with Cucumba on the different errors and things like that, and or crashes and uh, yeah, and not like there was. We're in a we're an assembly. There were no errors. What we got was crashes and memories dump. Want to use the proper terminology here, and and so then we worked our way through that to the point that okay, Nox or Chaos was functioning at the same uh, it had the same functionality that it did um, with his controller as it did with Waz's controller. Uh, you know, we, we we got it back to that point, and that was probably a six month process to. Uh, easily to to get it there, sure. and there was yeah. fine and there was fine tuning of, of of Pro RWTS that was going on right up to like a couple of weeks before release because of just how finicky the uh, the floppy drive is. And there's different models of floppy drives, and the, you know the drive arm doesn't move yeah. at the same speed, and all that had to be taken into consideration. And it was actually kind of a nightmare, uh, which is talked about in the making of Nox or Chaos book and how we got sure. through that, but. Um, so connecting all this back, um, yeah. So the uh, the end result, uh, which which just blew my mind, was Cucumba not only rewrote uh, you know Waz's uh, disk controller and made it compatible with Protoss ordered file systems. He made it uh, he made it better. Uh, he objectively did. Uh, both in terms of size and speed. And of course, it has to be acknowledged that he, he was standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, having had, you know, decades to look at Waz's work and think about, you know, where it could be done. You know, just like, well, you know, I was doing the Oxford Chaos vis-a-vis sure. -vis Garriott's work in Ultima. Um, but nonetheless, you know, just the thought, just the, you know, the, 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 I mean, Wozniak was so so brilliant. The, just the idea that that anybody could improve on what he did, sure. no matter how much time they had to spend on it, was a little bit of a you know it was like a wow moment for me. And uh, but yeah, objectively speaking, 
you know, the, it, this it's like a third of the memory. Uh, uh, Pro RW test is like a third of the memory of the 1979 WAS controller. And I did a stopwatch test on it. It is like seven times faster wow. in terms of the disk access. And I saw this early enough in the development of the game because this was probably um th this 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 was like pre pre alpha i mean i think i had like you know there was the overworld map and there was one town and um i, I had maybe started writing a little bit of nox a star but maybe, maybe not even that it was really early so you know there was no combat system there was no spell system there was no lots of systems and and so I had I had time to think about okay so how can we leverage this and um, one of the ways that I, I thought about leveraging it was like you know I I want some really awesome spell effects in this game I I knew that from the beginning I wasn't sure how to get it but I knew I wanted it. and specifically on the bucket list where I want a lightning bolt that sizzles across the mm -hmm. screen. I want a fireball that explodes. And there's actually a technical innovation story that goes around that that's separate from this topic. So I'd love to come back to that, to the lightning bolt and the fireball. Um, but uh, on the more general topic of spell effects, it, it's like, okay, so uh, spell effects in Ultima 5 were nothing like that. And uh, it, it was like there was a, 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 a tile-sized shape that um, would uh, you know be be projected towards you know what you were attacking that uh, looked kind of like a little glowing you know glowy blob type of thing and and that was it that's like what every the spell effect for every missile you know style spell and then and then when uh, you know for an area of effect scroll spell it would like invert the screen and do a high pitched noise and then you know blobs would die kind of a thing which was cool which was great. Um, and, and, and I think one of the reasons for that was that, uh, well, you know, you, you, you need, you need some code to do something more than that. Where, where's the memory that you're going to store that code in, you know, and the disc access, uh, under the, uh, 1979 was controller was too slow. You know, uh, it, it, it I, I mean, I tested it because it's like, if you press C to cast in combat and, uh, you read some code from disk for a spell effect of, of any nominal size, you're making the player wait a couple of seconds. Yeah. And that, that, that just doesn't feel right. You know, when a player enters a town, you know, waiting, you know, seven, eight, nine seconds is what, what it would take entering a town in Ultima five on the Apple II. It was probably longer, I'm guessing on the counter Commodore. And, and, and that was okay from a player perspective because, um, you know, you're entering an entire new map. You don't do it that often. But combat is like, you know, this is supposed to be this rapidly moving thing. So a couple second delay after hitting key to C to cast, that just doesn't feel right. Yeah. Um, and and so I, I didn't consider that to be viable. And I suspect other developers, I don't know how whether it was thought about or not, but if they did, I suspect that was the conclusion that they would have come to that. No, that, that just doesn't work from a gameplay perspective. Um, however, I saw that, wait a minute, with we, we, with seven times the speed, I tested it out and yeah, we could read in a, a block of code of meaningful size relative to, to, to what it could produce for spell effects. And I mean, there might be a slight little delay, but, but it, it's barely noticeable, uh, uh, even on floppy disk. Yeah. Um, that's in, cool. In and and that's and that and that is made possible uh, by that innovation. It's essentially a gameplay innovation that was made possible by a low level, uh, you know, machine level hardware, you know, interface level innovation on the disc control. Yeah, and it's totally worth it. As you're as you're upgrading your spells, they become more you know distributed across the the screen. They get bigger and more flashy. So that that definitely added to the fun. Did you hear that? No, sorry, I can't hear it. It oh. might be, you know, I'm, 
yeah, technical difficulties. I think it might be sufficient to tell people that when you boot up, you have this Nox yeah. Archaist commanding voice that always kicks off the game. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit how that came about? Sure. Um, yeah, so so that that was not planned uh, at all uh, at, at any point in the process. <laughs> um, it uh, it really uh, it 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 it, uh, it obviously happened, and so uh, this is the story of how. Um, well, the story starts with uh, Doctor Cat, uh, the uh, well-known Origin Systems programmer who also appeared in a couple of the games like the uh, the pub in Pause, I believe, in Ultima Six. Um, I think a few other times. So uh, I I got I got to know him through a friend in common, and uh, you know we were kind of talking off and on about Noxercast, and there was a point when uh, he told me about this technique that he had uh, uh, discovered, pioneered, invented whatever term you want to use in the late 1980s for getting the Apple II to be able to um, uh, produce. Uh, high quality sound, high enough quality for a human voice to be clearly heard and and understood. And and he said that it never made it into a commercial game. Um, and uh, he'd really love to see it, you know, uh, make it into Noxer cast, and it would be kind of like a, you know, a fulfilling of you know destiny there of, you know, so, sure. something you always wanted to happen that didn't happen. Um, and uh i thought uh you know okay well that you know that 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 that's that sounds interesting and um asked him for some more you know background on the whole thing and uh he said that uh uh in the late 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 1980s the game windwalker i believe it was windwalker was under development at origin and this is back when dr cat worked there and uh he tried to talk Greg Malone, the developer and, and kind of producer of uh, Mobius and, and its sequel, Windwalker, into putting 5-bit pulse width modulation into Windwalker, you know, somewhere. Um, and that the, according to Dr. Cat, I have not had the opportunity to talk to Greg Malone about this, but get uh, his perspective. According to Dr. Cat, uh, Greg's first reaction was, yeah, there's no way you're going to be able to get that to work. <laughs> <laughs> which is like you tell that to a programmer and the, you know the, the, that's that's uh that's when they're, they're going to really dig in so dr cat you know digs in uh was able to get you know his theory in, into practice and produce you know clearly sound you know this crystal clear sound with five bit pulse with modulation and i don't remember how much time it passed but i imagine it was it was a while and so he goes back to greg, greg malone oh uh the, the they had a, according to Dr. Cat, uh, Greg Malone, in fact, not only said he didn't think he was going to be able to get it to work, he bet him a cheeseburger on it. He's like, oh, over the whole thing. High stakes. And, and yeah, got to, got to put the stakes on it. So Dr. Cat eventually gets it to work, goes back to Greg Malone, and uh, whatever the, you know, it was, it was late stage in the development cycle with uh, Windwalker, you know, there are lots of considerations. And uh, even though, uh, you know, Dr. Cat did, in fact, get it to work, Greg Malone decided, no, not, not, not going to put it in. Um, and uh, so Dr. Cat uh, instead uh, took it to Soft Disk Magazine and basically did a tech demo, took it to, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure it was Soft Disk. It was one of the computer magazines of the day. And and they did an article on it, and uh, you know, like included it on the disc that went out on the magazine, and you know that was like as far as it ever went, as far as the public uh, view. And more importantly, Doctor Cat notes that to this day, Greg Malone still owes him that cheeseburger. <laughs> um, and uh, and that's pretty much where the story ends until you know his conversation with me about it, saying, hey, well, you know be really cool to have this in there and that kind of you know got me excited you know the whole the whole story of how it all went down and 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 thought yeah you know this 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 would be really nice to you know to have something like this and um it was getting kind of latish stage 
and Noxer has to be doing something like that as well. But decided, okay, well, let's let's let let's try uh, to to get this to happen. And one of the challenges was Dr. Cat had time to explain the concept of, of what he had done, but it didn't you know have time to actually jump in and do the programming for it, or at least not all of it. He did offer to do do a piece of it at one point, but um, not not like the full programming and the sound creation, which has to be in the right format for the programming and for it all to work together. And I honestly didn't have time to do any of it. I, nor did I personally have the sound skill to do it. Sound programming is a very special thing, especially sound programming at this level. And uh, I knew it was, it was not something I had the ability to do, nor did I have somebody on the team that that this was really, you know, their wheel, wheelhouse. I, I had one team member that maybe could have, you know, got, t taken a good crack at it, but he didn't really have, have time uh, to, to dig in that deep. And so ultimately, um, uh, I, I ended up recruiting K Chris Kenaway, uh, who is a programmer in the Apple II community that is known for his tech demos. Uh, and he wrote like a tech demo on the Apple IIe uh, uh, where, where it was hooked up to the internet. You know, there's some 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 electrical engineer who is an Apple II fan created a, you know, like a network adapter card. I think it's called the Ethernet card uh, for the Apple IIe to get it connected to uh, the internet. And, and Chris Crenaway wrote the code leveraging that, you know, internet connection to basically have streaming audio and video in double high res graphics off of an Apple IIe. And uh, of course, the graphics even in Apple uh, II high res, you know, is, is a far cry from seeing video on um, a modern computer. But you could kind of make out what the shapes were and, you sure. know, things. And uh, uh, he even got Doom running, you know, through this, you know, kind of mechanism. Um, but the audio, on the other hand, the audio was actually, I mean, really good because the quality of 5 bit pulse width modulation is just phenomenal. And you can get clear human voice from that. And of course, you've got, you know, your data and your memory limitations. But since it was streaming off of this modern built for the Apple II network card, you know, you didn't have those constraints. The data just kept coming in and it just kept cranking it out. So um, I, I thought, well, you know, let's reach out to Chris Kenaway and see would he be up for, you know, doing doing this implementation, and uh, and 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 he was. And uh, I I don't know to this day. This is getting a, a, off a little bit on, on some esoteric historical you know uh, side of it, and I and I do want to talk a little bit on you know uh, technically how does this even work. But um, I don't know to this day whether or not there the the uh, Chris Kenaway's uh, technique uh, traces back to Dr. Katz's work in the yeah. 1980s, or 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 if it was two people figured it out independently. I know Chris Kenaway learned it from work that a gentleman by the name of Michael Mann did in the 1990s, and uh, there was a bunch of posts and things, you know, in in the 90s about it. And, and Michael Mann is still around. Chris might have even talked to him at one point, but that's where he learned it from. What I don't know, because I've never had the opportunity to meet or speak with Michael Mann, is did Michael Mann develop it on his own, figure it all out on his own, which he could have, sure. or did he get a hold of the soft disk magazine that had Dr. Katz's tech demo in it and basically take that and build on it? I don't know. And I, I it's, it's, you know, one uh, uh, so, something I'd be very curious to know, and maybe someday I'll, I'll uh, have the opportunity to, to meet Michael Mann and ask him. But uh, in any event, that's really just a historical footnote on the whole thing. Uh, the bottom line is it's the same stuff, five bit pulse width modulation. And um, how it works goes something like this. Uh, on the, the Apple II speaker uh, is a very simple speaker. It look, under the case, it looks like something you could buy at Radio Shack. Commodore has much better sound capabilities in every way. Uh, the uh, uh, Apple II speaker uh, is basically capable of being in two states. It's either on or it's off. And all the sounds you hear coming out of the Apple II are a function of turning the speaker on and off, on and off. And when you turn it on, how long do you leave it on before you turn it off? You know, that's your duration uh, variable. And uh, when you're doing that, turning the speaker on, leaving it on for some period of time, turning it off, what you get is 
a square wave. <laughs> and square waves, you know, that produces the sound on the Apple II that, you know, all we're we're all familiar with if we've heard an Apple II. And 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 I, I apologize, I don't know that much about how the Commodore works for sound. Uh, I know it's better, uh, but are there square waves involved there, David? Do you know? So yeah, the Apple II has a one-bit speaker, so you 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 know, it's either this way or this way, and you choose the rate at which you do that to create a square wave of a certain perceived pitch. On the Commodore, there is no speaker built into the machine itself. It is sending the audio signal to uh, your monitor or television set, and there's a special um, chip that has you know three oscillators and different waveforms and filters and a tact case, sustain release, and ring mod and hard sinks and all kinds of stuff going on it's it's a different animal but but what's impressive about the thing you're describing is what you can do with a one bit controlled speaker so back to you <laughs> like that you can do much of anything is yeah exactly so you know uh i mean that that's what was producing the sound in games like ultima and and castle wolfenstein and uh, uh except for music Mus music you know there was a mockingboard card in the apple II that was used for music in actually not many games at all, but uh, Ultima 3 through 5 had that. Uh, any kind of music created off of the 8-bit speaker, I mean, I, 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 it, it, it was done, but it was, you know, not great. Uh, we'll, we'll just say that. Um, so in any event, so that, that's what we're working with, is basically we can make square waves. That's, you know, the, the starting point, you know, technically to uh, the, the, the challenge. And what Dr. Cat figured out uh, first, uh, at least, having done it in the late 80s and possibly eventually independently by, by Michael Mann we do, uh, or, or related, we don't know. Uh, what Dr. Cat figured out in the late 1980s is that if you write some really, really tight code, uh, you can turn the Apple II speaker on um and and off really rapidly in such a way that you can round off the edges of the square wave now let's dive into that a little bit it's like you turn theoretically you have okay the speaker's on and then you have it off except you're controlling that through code through a soft switch so if you tell the speaker to turn on and and then uh you tell it to turn off a different soft switch Okay, so it's turning off, but before it's fully powered down, you flip the soft switch to tell it to turn on again. You can do some really interesting stuff. And between a, a full power up on and a full power down off, you've got all these different places that you can wait before you send that power up again. And that's where you get the granularity from that takes your square wave, rounds the edges off, which is the key to the subtleties of something like human voice being able to be clearly understood. And the code to do that, um, because speed is of the essence, you know, because because you're you're racing the hardware, uh, you know, with with its power up and power down cycle, you're in a race against uh, how fast the, the hardware is doing that to to be to be flipping these soft switches. It results in um, code that has to be so tight that if you started out with a lump of coal, you'd end up with a diamond. Uh, it's it's really it's 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 only barely possible. because it, 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 it's just it's just hitting up against the threshold where you just can't optimize it any further, and the the one megahertz processor is just maximized in every possible way i mean we're talking about to the point that uh if you cross a page boundary where you you know you've got op codes that take an extra clock cycle if they cross a page boundary that's enough for it to be not fast enough if that happens at at, at the wrong place in the code you can't use any pseudo ops to make that uh hit that the unintended operations to to hit those speed or do you just use all standard 6502 instructions all it's all standard 6502 okay. yeah 
So thank you very much for this deep dive. Uh, before we go, um, you have Nox Arceus 2 there in the background. Um, tell us a little bit about what the next game is. I assume you're going to get the chance to change your um, engine a little bit and do new technical goodness. Um, just give us a, a quick wrap up of when it's happening. And if people can help, tell us how that can happen as well. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, uh, a couple, a couple, couple things. So, firstly, if you happen to be interested in the original Nox Arceus game or the expansion for it, uh, you can get that by heading over to noxarcaeus.com and clicking on the store, uh, the store link. They're both also available in Steam on Steam and Good Old Games um, uh, with a you know built-in emulator. The two books, the Book of Hints, Making of Nox Arceus, those are also available on the website mentioned as well as Steam and Good Old Games. Uh, Nox Arceus 2 is going to be a full sequel. Uh, it takes place in a region called Dragon's Mirror. Uh, the uh, first game took place uh, in a region called Isles of Windmar. These are two regions of a broader world called Valley. Uh, so what uh, you can infer from that is Dragon's Mirror will have a completely different uh, overworld map. Um, and uh, we, some of the goals that we have for it are to uh, have more large uh, portrait uh, images uh, in the game, uh, like for example, when um, like if you make camp, there's this uh, like a quarter of the screen size portrait image that pops up and the merchants have por portrait images like this. Um, so we, we, we want to have a lot more uh, of that uh, in the game uh, is one thing we want to do. Uh, we're also completely redoing the statistical system which is at, of course, like the core of the game loop. Um, you know, so things like uh, items and how classes work or how our skills work, or, you know, I mean, Nox doesn't even ha have classes. It's a skill-based system, but all the interplay between all of that and the spell system, that, that's going to get rewritten and improved. And that will result in rewriting big chunks of the game engine, uh, like basically rewriting combat, probably rewriting most inventory and, and, and merchants and things like that, and probably spawn some other interesting content, uh, you know, ideas. There could be different merchants and things that crop up because of, uh, you know, stuff going on in the stat system. Uh, so that's uh, definitely a big goal as well. I'm also going to try to put in an auto mapper uh, in the game uh, that uh, will kind of keep track of uh, your position as, as you go, probably a fog of war, you know, style uh, thing. And uh, if not that, I would probably plan B would be to do something like Ultima did with peering at a gem where you can get a map of, you know, the region. It's still intended to be a game where you're going to have fun with the graph paper if that's your thing. Uh, I will still design it in with that point of view in mind. The auto mapper or peer at a gem would just be an augment for those that would, you know, prefer uh, to do it that way. Um, so it's going to be a big undertaking. Uh, I'm also rewriting uh, the Noxer case tool chain in the process, uh, you know, map editor, pixel editor, game item, data management, things like that. Uh, the tools that I did for that the first time around were kind of clunky, going to redo those, which is going to be a big time investment. But ultimately, if if not speed up the delivery of this game, it uh, might be a wash, you know, on the first one, but certainly for future games and expansions, uh, the, the, those tools are going to pay uh, big dividends. So that's that's kind of what we have in store. Uh, the project just just kicked off here in uh, about two months ago. Uh, we did a Patreon campaign uh, to to raise support for it, and uh, we hit uh, 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 we hit a hundred percent of the minimum goal, uh, which was great, absolutely wonderful. Thanks so much for everyone uh, who contributed to that, and uh, we hit about eighty five percent of the ideal goal. Uh, and so if this sounds like a project that uh, you're interested in, uh, we could we could definitely still, uh, you know, use your help with it and it would be much, much appreciated. And you can find uh, our Patreon campaign at uh, patreon.6502workshop.com. And uh, we look forward to uh, delivering a excellent, excellent uh, RPG a second time in a row. Uh, well, or third time if you count the Lord of Storms expansion, but uh, second time in a row in terms of a full game. Uh, hey, that expansion then, took me 40 hours right there. So it, there's a lot of game in just the expansion. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, and it, it, it is brought to you, if not entirely by the same team, largely by the same team. Uh, I was the lead developer on uh, the original game and will be on the second. And uh, uh, the uh, some of the other, uh, my teammates from the original game are already getting involved in Nox or Chaos uh, 2. It's possible we might get some new folks involved in along the way, but uh, you can definitely count on, you know, this, this is... Uh, uh, it's going to have the same look and feel. It's coming from the same mind and minds, uh, et cetera. Excellent. Okay. Well, with that, again, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I look forward to playing welcome. playing your next offering. And uh, I think we'll close it here. Uh, see you on Discord. Sounds good. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, see you on Discord. Have okay. a good day.